Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's seminar. It's a great pleasure to have Professor Amal Al Ghazali here with us today. Uh, Amal is an assistant professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Cornell University. Uh, her work combines magnetism for electricity and optics to create tunable, versatile electronic systems for telecommunication sensing and actuation. Prior to joining Cornell, uh, Amal was a postdoctoral research fellow at UC Berkeley, where she was awarded the University of California pre uh, President's Postdoctoral Fellowship. Uh, it's very, it's a pleasure to have Amal here with us today to learn about her work on magnetic, magnetic elastomers enabling haptic displays. But before I turn it over to Amal, I would like to uh, remind our audience that you can ask your questions either using the Q&A option of this webinar, or you can, at the end of the talk, raise your hand and directly ask your question. So with that, Amal, thank you very much for being here today, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much for the introduction, Farnas. Um, so I just would like to start the, the talk by, by first giving you my vision. Um, this slide, uh, this title slide shows my, my dream for a long time, and it's that if we could um, interact with our displays in a way that you could actually feel what you're seeing on the display. So if you're playing you know, air hockey or something, you actually get to feel that puck and move it and interact with your screen as you're playing the game. And so the, the obvious question would be, how do, we, how do we actually develop a system like this? We're all trained um, in, to think in terms of electronics. Um, integrated circuits, you're talking in terms of electronic charge flow. Um, we apply voltages at the terminals, everything is electric. And even modern touch screens are um, the first set of touch screens were using resistive uh, sensors to, to evaluate where you were touching. And now it's capacitive, but still it's a matter of charge and electric potential. So you might, you're, you might ask, where do magnets fit into all of this? I'm talking about magnetic elastomers for haptics. So how does this all work out? Before I jump into that, I just want to give a bit of a magnetic history so that we can see how much of a challenge it is to really get magnetics to um, the nanoscale and into these integrated electronics. Back at the beginning of, of magnetic systems, we were working with very large scale magnetics, um, electric motors in the 1800s, power transmission, very large bulky systems, even nuclear magnetic resonance. As magnetic systems got smaller, then we started seeing AC-DC converters, but still the magnetic components are these large bulky inductors and transformers on the printed circuit boards next to the electronics, not actually integrated on chip. Um, they, they're they also used in optical isolators, which are very large bulky isolators. Um, and finally, more recently, we've been seeing nanoscale magnets in data storage, in magnetic random access memory, and the introduction of spintronics being used to control magnetic um, memory as well as resistance, magnetoresistance to be used to detect the magnetic um, state. So electrical integration of magnetics, which has been the crucial uh, key point of how do we integrate magnets into the rest of our electronic systems. So naturally the next question is where do we go from here? And um, part of my work what I hope to show you is my vision for where magnetics will fit into these future electronics, specifically for haptic displays. Um, most of us, or most people, when I talk to them about magnets, the, the most they know is the op opposites attract. So you know that when you put a north to south pole together, then they attract. And if you put north to north, they repel. Um, and if you put dust some um, iron or ferrite particles, then they follow these nice field lines from the north to the south side. Um, but the, well, although this might be nice for a children's demo um, and outreach or something, there's a lot more to it as well. So if we just take each one of these particulates and look at what its magnetic properties are, there's a wealth of information that we can get and a, and a wealth of opportunities for the design of the system um, that come from it. And so a lot of what I focus on is on how do you design these magnetic properties? Um, here I show some hysteresis loops for either a hard magnet, so the white curve where the magnet um, uh, 
maintains its magnetization regardless of how much field is applied within a certain range. Um, are, that represents hard magnets. And um, the complete opposite is the soft magnet. So the blue line where it um, responds, magnetization responds with the magnetic field. And then there are particles that are somewhere in between or magnetic materials that are somewhere in between and that's represented by the yellow line. So the next question of course is how do we control it? And dynamically and controlling elect um, Electrically controlling magnetism has been challenging in the past, but there's still a lot that can be done. One example here that's actually from MIT is magnetic field control at a distance just using a magnet. So the MIT group had embedded magnetic particles into this flexible film. And by putting a magnet under the table, they can control how the robot moves in space. Uh, and it can roll, it can contract, it can move in however way they want it to. We can also control magnets electrically with an electric field. Um, and that's only if you integrate it with a piezoelectric. So let's say we put a magnet um, on top of a piezoelectric like barium titanate, then apply a large electric field across it. That strain that's exerted from the piezoelectric to the magnet can change the magnetization. And that's in represented here by the change from a whitish color contrast to a dark color um, that can be observed uh, through mag magneto-optic Kerr effect microscopy. And lastly, probably the most recent technique is uh, spintronics, uh, where a current flowing through electrodes can provide a spin um, from the electron, a spin torque on the, the magnetization of a film. Depending on the configuration of the fields and the magnetization, you, it can switch. And so my work utilizes all these different uh, techniques. And my lab focuses on using them for sensors, actuators, and communications. But for today's talk, I'll just focus on just the actuators part, the haptics. And let me expand on my vision first. Um, if you've ever met me in person, you, or even now, if you see, um, I have very, very fat fingers. It's a, um, a massive hassle when I'm dealing with uh, mobile technology. So I try to spell anything on the phone and almost every single text message or email is going to come out misspelled unfortunately. So if you interact with me, then just be aware that that's why. Um, so I've had this dream of, well, can I actually just interact physically with the touch screen? Why can it deform in three dimensions and allow me to touch um, actual keys that, are, that I'm visually seeing on the screen? And then can those keys disappear so that the next minute, if I want to have a map or if I want to guide, um, let's say, a, a blind individual, if they want to be able to be self-sufficient and travel through streets, then they can topographically evaluate where they need to go and become much more self-sufficient that way. If in order to create a haptic display like this, it needs to be not only highly deformable, but also reconfigurable. So the same touch screen should be able to deform to create those keys and relax back to nothing. So there's some work out of a company called Tactus Technology in Fremont, California that produced um, a touch screen that creates pads um, for keypads. And although this is a haptic display, so they, they can generate those buttons when they want uh, to create that feeling that you're touching buttons, it's not actually versatile. It's not actually reconfigurable. So the goal of my work is to create that reconfigurability integrated with the haptic display. And a lot of methods have existed in the past for haptics. Um, mechanical is probably the, the simplest and the most widespread. So there are pins that can come out and then they give you this sensation that you're feeling a surface um, with a different topo topology or topography. Um, there's a thermal, uh, um, phase change materials that can generate bumps um, and give us a, a surface that we want based on a thermal interaction um, or based on a, uh, heating. If, if there are vibrations through the air, then it can produce a sensation on, on your hand at a distance. Um, the most popular ones are pneumatic. So if air is 
is pushed through a material, then it can inflate and give you that 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 touch sensation of, of an inflated screen um, and electrical. So a dielectric elastomer can, if you apply a voltage across it, can either squish or release. And, and of course, uh, my work is magnetic. So I'll be focusing a lot more on, on the magnetic technique. Um, just to give you an overview of how challenging this is going to be, let me walk you through what, what is actually happening within the touch screen um, or within the haptic display. So a, if we have a magnetoresponsive layer, if a magnetic field is applied to it, it can stretch and, and provide that deformation that we want. But um, we also need a flexible substrate underneath it. So if the magnetic material stretches, in order for it to bend upward, it needs to have compression on the other side. So having a non-magnetic layer that doesn't respond to the magnetic field confines it, and then we get that bending motion. Uh, to produce the very small local magnetic fields that make it reconfigurable, we need to use these nanomagnets. And then if you have nanomagnets, you also need to be able to switch those nanomagnets to create a local magnetic field. So I have electrodes on the top. If one of those magnets is switched, then you produce a local magnetic field sufficient to, again, stretch that magnetoresponsive layer and then cause the bending that you need. So all of this is, of course, a very um, challenging vision, but we hope to approach it just step by step by looking at the different um, requirements of each of the, the layers. First, the magnetic elastomer layer, in order for it to deform and actually enough provide enough of a sensation to our, to our hand, we need to have a, a certain amount of deformation, right? How much can we feel? Um, if, if you just touch a hair, like rub a hair between your hands, you can probably feel it, but it's not much of a sensation. So my estimate is that we probably want, you know, five to 10 hairs. So one micron, so one, one hair is like 100 microns. So it, ideally, we want to aim for a millimeter deformation out of the plane, and let's say over the distance of one millimeter as well in the plane. That, um, that gives a 41% strain uh, in the magnetic layer. So most magnetic materials cannot achieve that at all. Most magnetic materials are brittle. So as soon as you try to stretch them a little bit, they will crack. Um, you can look at plastic materials as well. There are, there's another category of materials where if they stretch at some point, they will start to neck, meaning that they cannot recover back their properties. So we want to avoid those as well. And instead we choose elastomers, meaning materials that can stretch so much and still recover fully. Um, and they can hopefully stretch much, much more than, than we want to um, use them with for within the actuation. So how do we create a magnetic elastomer? So elastomers are not magnetic initially. For that, my student Ludovico Cesarolo is working on developing a magnetic elastomer. So putting magnetic particles into a typical elastomer that we can buy commercially. So we're using Ecoflex um, 30, uh, 0030 and mix it, mix the magnetic particles into it. Then we apply a magnetic field and produce that deflection that's desired. Uh, our very first attempt at it, just to see how much it stretches, is, is kind of fun to see. So I, I went ahead and included that video, just put a bunch of particles in, and you can see how much it just easily stretches um, in response to a magnetic field from that bottom magnet. We've, of course, improved the design a lot more. So there are a lot of considerations that we need to keep in mind. And the first is having isotropic versus anisotropic behavior. If you just mix part magnetic particles into an elastomer, then they're randomly oriented, and they probably won't give you the mechanical response that you want. Because when you apply a magnetic field to them, the first thing is that each one of those individual particles first has to rotate to align with the magnetic field. And then that magnetic moment has to then uh, respond to the magnetic field, so deflect in accordance to the magnetic field. In contrast, though, you could have an anisotropic material so one where the magnetic particles are already aligned, and then that response is going to be a lot easier, a lot faster. So instead of losing energy in the rotation of the magnetic particles themselves, you're transferring all that energy from into the mechanical deformation. Um, our work has been on the, 
has been focusing on comparing the two. Um, to create an anisotropic material, we apply a magnetic field while it's curing. So we mix the particles in, apply a magnetic field, and the local interactions between magnets creates that nice chain-like behavior. And this magnetic field is, is actually quite reasonable to produce in any lab. Um, currently, we were using 350 milliteslas, which we uh, generate from just a C magnet that we built in the lab. Uh, we're also interested in, in producing the best possible display as well, right? So we want to give um, nanoscale texture, a micro scale texture. So up to date, the magnetorheological elastomers that have been developed so far mostly use microparticles of uh, tens, tens of microns or larger, even in the hundreds of micron sizes. So those particles, if you try to put it into a film and bend it, it can't actually bend on the size, on the scale of the particle dimensions itself, of course. So you, you're only going to get resolution of a texture that is larger than the dimension of the particle. If we want to move to uh, micro texture, so let's say you wanna even be able to replicate those um, ridges of the fingerprints on your skin, then we need nanoparticles. And you can see here that nanoparticle uh, magnetorheologicals have not yet been significantly explored. Um, so we're trying to contribute to this research as well. One of the first, uh, one of the first things that we did was to try to evaluate what is or theoretically the optimal particle concentration when we work with nanoparticles. So if you have, if you imagine each of these is a chain of particles in the, the vertical direction, how close do those particles need to be in order for us to get um, no chain interactions with each other? So why do we want no interaction between the magnetic chains? If you have an isolated chain that sees essentially no other magnets near it, when you apply a magnetic field, it will respond and then recover fully. But if there's another magnet nearby, then when they interact with when they um, are moved, they will also be interacting with each other. And it's likely they'll lock into a preferred orientation and not be able to fully recover. So if we want that reconfigurability, we need to have um, enough magnetic particles to respond to the magnetic field, but that have them sufficiently spaced apart. So have a low enough concentration to where they're not interacting. And we just did a, um, some quick simulations to see this. So if you imagine one set of particles here on the left, then um, another set of particles on the right side, as you move the, the particles closer to each other, then you get, um, then you get a larger, um, magnetic field, magnetic flux density between the two. So as they move farther and farther apart, then that magnetic flux density settles to, to near nothing. And we, call, we consider that to be non-interacting. Uh, for this work, we focused on creating samples with 1.5 diameter spacing or more um, between the two magnetic chains, which if you calculate the volume concentration that corresponds to two to 8% volume content. And we can also calculate how much mass of iron particles to stick in, et cetera. So all of that together, we define what we consider to be our optimal volume fraction in order to achieve minimal hysteresis in, um, in the sample, minimal magnetic hysteresis in the sample. To fabricate the samples, I'll just go through this very quickly. Um, we mix the particles inside, as well as some thinner ultrasonic it mix the part B of the elastomer that starts to initiate the curing process. Um, stir everything together and put it into a mold, then degas it to remove any air that could be in the, the mixture. Um, and then we finally um, seal it in a vacuum bag. And, and this, te this technique was used so that a, um, a uniform pressure was applied to the surface so that we get absolute uniform film thickness throughout the material. Because if we try to put the, the mold cover uh, on our own, just manually, then we ended up with the slanted surfaces. So vacuum sealing ended up giving us this pristine thickness all, all throughout. Uh, and our films ended up being 200 microns or so in thickness. In the last step, we either, we either cure 
uh, in a magnetic in a uniform magnetic field to get the isotro anisotropic behavior or without a magnetic field that gives us the anisotropic behavior. So these are some example cross-sectional SEM images. Um, the top is the isotropic case. And so you see the distribution of particles is random versus the anisotropic case in the bottom where they, they're more in a columnar arrangement and get uh, chains. Then the next question was to evaluate how much deflection do we get for each of these films? And this is, uh, the deflection measurement is quite simple. We just apply a magnet, magnetic field gradient by bringing a magnet closer to the sample. And then as it deflects, we measure how far it deflected. So these results um, surprisingly gave us exactly what we were expecting um, in terms of where it plateaus, at what concentration does it plateau? So as you go from 2% to 8% volume concentration, we actually see that uh, the 6 to 8%, um, there is very little improvement, if any, going from 6 to 8%. So 6% looks like it's the, the best possible composition. But we do actually see that isotropic, for so, uh, surprisingly, gives us larger deflection than anisotropic. And we later characterized this to be due to the fact that the remnant magnetization of the particles is very small. So when we, when we apply that field gradient, the isotropic particles can actually magnetize along any field direction and respond better to the uh, field gradient than an isotropic case. I'm happy to discuss that more um, at a later time. But for, for now, I'll just continue with the mechanical optimization. We also looked at the um, loading versus unloading. So how much uh, deflection was created for each of those um, when you're applying the magnetic field in the, in the uh, increasing, increasing the magnetic field or, or decreasing the magnetic field. And for the six volume percent was, uh, we see that it starts to plateau here at that point. And the hysteresis between those two, these, those two operations is also, um, one larger for the anisotropic film, but is also plateauing at that 6%. Uh, to characterize the mechanical behavior that resulted in this, in addition to the fact that the particles are not interacting as much, we, we measured the stress strain and evaluated the Young's modulus in the low strain regime. So if you plot the Young's modulus versus the magnetic, the magnetization, or the magnetic content in each of these films, we actually see that the Young's modulus increases at a much faster rate than the magnetic particle content. So this 6% volume con uh, concentration ended up being optimal not only for the magnetic, the nearest neighbor interactions, but also in the fact that the, the stiffness increases dramatically at that point um, as you increase more magnetic particles. And so there's a drawback to putting in more magnetic particle content. You would think that adding more particles means that they would respond more to a magnetic field, but as the stiffness increases dramatically at a faster rate, then um, it ends up negating that effect. And 6% is that sweet spot in between those two behaviors. We did a quick demo um, for how this can be useful. And so this is a, a braille inspired display where you can see that we actuate different um, braille positions to represent each of the different letters uh, using these solenoid plungers that either pull, um, bring a magnetic uh, mag magnet closer and generate that local magnetic field or pull it away farther. And that created um, a braille like display in the surface. We, the other question we wanted to prove is, is whether or not nanoparticles actually perform better than microparticles, or, or if um, their only advantage is that we would be able to get nanoscale texture, microscale texture resolution. So we, prefer, we built the same exact materials out of microparticles. Um, these are four to eight microns in size, and we have both anisotropic as well as isotropic films. And you can see from the, these results that the magnetic particle, the nanoscale magnetic particles perform just as well, if not better, for smaller magnetic fields, um, which are what are going to be typically produced within a device, within a haptic portable device. 
but then as you get to larger magnetic fields, then the microparticles do in fact uh, deform uh, the film a lot more. So that can be summarized by looking at this graph. Uh, so going from micro to nanoparticles in the anisotropic films, there's a 33% or 47% increase in how much deflection is achieved. Um, so this is quite convincing for us that we're in the right direction, we're going in the right direction and nanoparticles are potentially the future for haptics. Uh, another reason for why the micro particles perform better, um, especially at those larger, uh, those larger fields is because they naturally have larger magnetic moment in, in the film itself. Uh, not only is the size larger, uh, but so it, the, because the size of the magnetic particles is larger for the same um, concentration within the film, you have a larger net magnetization. But at the low field values, you see that the magnetic nanoparticles have a higher remnants. And so we get the better performance at, at low fields. So the next question that we try to tackle or we are tackling is how do we improve the films by, uh, by improving the magnetic particles themselves, the, the embedded particles of the films. And for that, we have some constraints. One, the, the films need to be nanoscale in order to be able to deform properly. We also want the magnetic particles to maintain their magnetization. So they should be small, but not so small that they are super paramagnetic, meaning that they would be thermally agitated and, and constantly changing their magnetization as a function of time. And, and they should have a large magnetic moment, as large as possible, hopefully. Um, and so my student Yulan Chen is working on synthesizing magnetic particles for this purpose. Uh, and for this, we're trying to increase that magnetic moment at zero field. So our ideal behavior for a magnetic particle would be a hard magnetic material, in which case we want large saturation magnetization. So as large a magnetization as possible, but also large coercivity so that when there's no field applied, it maintains as much of its magnetization uh, and then all the rest, and then when a field is applied, all of it is transferred into mechanical uh, behavior. And, um, and optionally, it can also have a high Curie temperature so that it can respond to any, in any environment at any temperature needed. We did some initial simulations to prove this. And so at small, or to determine what is the optimal size of the particles and, and uh, design our synthesis procedure. So at very large particles dimensions, you see what is typical in the magnetics field of um, either multi-domain magnetic particles so that the magnetization splits into domains or um, a curling type behavior. So the magnetization forms like a vortex around the central axis. Um, and finally, at very small sizes, we get that single domain, large remnant magnetization, uh, which you can see on the, the y-axis. So we actually synthesized particles of this size um, and found that indeed our synthesized particles, which are iron 65, cobalt 35, have higher remnant magnetization than any of the commercial particles we could find. So any magamite particles or any pure iron particles that we found um, commercially from like Sigma Aldrich or, or other sources. Um, SS Nano is another. And our particles come with this cubic shape. We're, it's still not the ideal behavior that we want. Like I, of course, I, we want the, the nice square loop, but we're moving towards higher remnants, which is the ideal scenario. And we further can improve that remnant hysteresis. So get, get that remnants higher by uh, also manipulating the shape. If you have uh, a single particle, it tends to demagnetize itself. But if you have many particles in a chain, then that shape and isotropy can result in a stronger preference to align um, with that magnetic orientation. And for most uh, for most researchers to produce those chain like alignments, they apply magnetic field uh, uh, while the synthesis is happening. So uh, around the beaker, they will apply a magnetic field and then those chains start to, to come to, the particles start to come together to form a chain. We actually created these chains through just simply 
having a much higher concentration during the synthesis. And then the dipole interactions between magnets formed chains naturally. So I'll talk a little bit about that. The iron cobalt particles were indeed shown um, through uh, XRD that they are uh, iron cobalt. Um, so these are the typical peaks for it. And you can see from the SEM image that they are intact as a single chain. So they grew onto each other. And this is advantageous because in most other cases, when a magnetic field is applied during synthesis, they can attach, the particles can attach to each other, but as soon as that magnetic field is removed, a lot of times they break apart or will break apart with the slightest bit of uh, exertion. Um, now that they have formed and bonded to each other in a chain, then they will remain in that, in that form. We get this uh, trend for moving from uh, single particle synthesis to nanochain synthesis as a function of concentration. So I'll quickly go over this uh, behavior. And this was done at three different um, con metal concentration regimes. Also, those nanochains are formed um, as a, the, the length of the nanochains is a function of the concentration as well. So here you can see that it's at lower concentrations, we have shorter nanochains. And then as they increase, the, as the concentration increases, the length of the nanochain increases. And ideally, as the length of the nanochain increases, we would expect to have higher remnants. Um, but I'll show that we also see some other unique behavior. So uh, with the chain length, alongside the, the increase in the chain length, we also see an increase in the side length of the particles. And uh, that comes with the drawback of uh, a, an angle to the magnetization. So the larger the size, the less that magnetization within the particle is oriented with, uh, along its z-axis. There's a slight angle to the magnetization and more domain formation, which leads to a lower net magnetization. The other interesting phenomenon, which you can see from the SEM images, is that as the length and magnetization change, the particles are bonding with each other uh, in a different way. So they either align nicely face-to-face -face or they start to align at an, at an angle. So they, they have this edge-to-edge -edge arrangement when the magnetization is uh, slightly off axis. And then finally, a more extreme corner-to-corner -corner arrangement when it's, when it's far off its axis. What another advantage though of having uh, this high concentration uh, ridge this is though is that we get exactly the constant um, the metal concentration that we put in so the iron to cobalt ratio that we put in is also what we get out whereas conventional synthesis techniques usually you get a loss or a difference in the concentration compared to what you put in. Um, so we tried to evaluate how this happens or why does this physically happen? And uh, we looked at the two main forces that, that matter here. So we're not considering gravitational force or um, van der Waal forces interactions between particles at the small scale because during the synthesis, we have a spinner ongoing. So it would naturally break or oppose any of those two forces. Instead, the two key forces that would cause this um, chain-like formation are the magnetic force that would bond them together and drag force that would break them apart. And we, there's, a, there's a region here where the drag force dominates versus the magnetic force. And so if, there's a lar if the particles are large enough in size and the, there's a high enough concentration, so they're close enough in distance, then we actually get this chain-like formation. And here we can characterize what that formation looks like. So you can see that the chains um, have a higher, oh, the graph didn't come out well, um, have a high remnant magnetization. And when they are parallel versus perpendicular, when we orient those chains parallel to the magnetic field for the measurement, you can actually, you can see that magnetization is, is very large compared to the other config orientations. Um, so I'll try to go through the rest very quickly because I know I'm coming up against time, I think. Um, 
we can look at how those magnetic chains interact. So again, we want to see if we put this into a magnetic elastomer, we want those uh, ideal anisotropic chain orientations, and then we want to be able to space them at the right distance so that they're not interacting. So if they were just particles randomly arranged, their interaction distance, which is indicated by the y-axis, is quite large. So you see a very large spread in that arrangement, um, whereas as they become more and more chain-like, if they're just ran randomly oriented as chains, then you get a slightly narrower distribution. And then finally, if, if they are um, parallel chains, it's a very tight interaction distance. And the rest here is just noise, background noise that uh, as a result of the measurement. But you can see that it's, it's a much narrower region. Um, so we, we really do have these, these chains can be very advantageous to making those haptic displays. And this is all summarized by this graph. So if we look at the switching field distribution, which is um, how, how easily they can be flipped, um, it, it also tells you how much interaction is between the particles. If the, the particles themselves individually have a much broader arrangement, and then as they become um, more parallel oriented chains have a tighter distribution. We use these same chains in a magnetic elastomer. So finally, we want to be able to see how does this behave me uh, mechanically. Uh, so we use the same procedure as before to create the magnetic elastomer film and characterize its in-plane and out-of-plane magnetization. And you can see the iron and cobalt in the SEM images, or the EDS SEM images. So they are forming nice chain-like orientations. And then we characterize the, the mechanics of it uh, visually uh, as well as, as, well as um, optically. So we have, uh, we made two films with the magnetization orientations opposite to each other and then embedded them in a single elastomer. Um, and stuck it vertically onto an, an aluminum plate. So we see two, two mechanical uh, deformation regimes, one bending and one twisting. I'll show the first case. In the bending scenario, um, let's see if it, I think it just froze. Um, Okay, my computer is a little slow, but you can see that as we move the film closer to one magnet versus to the other, it bends in the opposite direction. So what's happening physically here is that as it moves closer to let's say the north or the south, it magnetizes the chains in that direction, and then it's physically attracted to it as well. So that's what causes the uh, film itself to bend towards that di direction of the magnet. We we have the, um, the because those two panels are oppositely magnetized, we can also rotate the film and have it see a twisting behavior as well. So in this case, the, um, each of those panels as it's rotating experiences a, of a magnetic field and the cross product of that magnetic field with the magnetization in the plane um, generates a torque. And so each half, um, each one of those two panels has an opposite bending direction. That's what you see is the twisting behavior of the film. That's most of what I wanted to present today, but I want to give a little bit of insight into where we're going to take this from here. So we're still working on optimizing the magnetic films as well as um, the controls of them using the nano magnetic nanodots on top. And then the next step will be to fully integrate this with a control uh, regime where we can switch the magnetic control dots, these magnetic patterns on top and create the local magnetic field that'll cause the deformation. Um, potential applications for all of this work are what I described, the haptic um, integration of touch screens, but also you could see this as being just simply a, a textured displays. So for the visually impaired um, to take along with them wherever they go. And it can uh, enhance vi virtual reality um, by providing you the tactile sensation that you would see in your ocular glasses. Uh, and potentially also give a more realistic experience for remote manipulation of surgeries or anything else now that we're working in a very remote access world. Um, Telemanipulation needs uh, tactile accuracy.
And with that, I would like to thank you all for, for attending. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Amal, for a very, very interesting talk. So we have time for a few questions. Again, you can uh, type your questions through the Q&A or just raise your hand and we'll unmute you to ask your question. So uh, we already have a couple of questions. Um, so what can you comment on what kind of materials uh, will you use in the elastomer uh, where when you use the device like a smartphone, um, for the user, the finger is not going to scratch the display. So I guess uh, mechanical robustness of of your material. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess that's, that's a good question. So right now the elastomers are very mechanically robust. Um, they uh, they're very soft and compliant. So um, if you if you touch it or if you, if you drop it or anything like that, it won't break, it, it's, it's very flexible. Um, so that could be one option. I think that the main challenge with that though is as we put magnetic particles into them, not only as you, can, as you saw, do they become more rigid, but also they become optically opaque. So I didn't talk about that at all during this talk, but the integration of magnetic elastomers with visual displays will be a major challenge because, um, you, you can touch it and experience the, the tactile deformation, but in order for it to um, provide the, the visual, what we're used to with the tactile, the, the visual displays of our touch screens, that one will be uh, the challenge. So what, one thing we're working on is also trying to see if there can be uh, optically transparent magnetic particles or making the magnetic particles small enough so that the light can pass through. Um, and in, in doing so, hopefully we can integrate um, the soft elastomers that, that you know, won't, um, that by touching it, it won't, it won't de de deform or disturb the, the sway, but, but also still give you the visual aspect. The next question is asking, would you, can you share uh, a bit about the fabrication process for the magnetic nanocubes? Um, sure, yeah, so the, so it's a, polyol process, um, which I guess, let me go back to that slide. We, uh, so this is, uh, we use iron acetate and, and cobalt, um, cobalt acetate, I think as well, uh, uh, and mix, so the, we mix these precursors of um, some that have uh, iron and some that have the cobalt contribution into, into a, um, a synthesis flask, so a beaker. Um, but we had already heated up the, the solution in which the, the solvent in which they're going to react. So that's the ethylene glycol in this case. Um, and then when, when they start, when that reaction starts to happen, it's uh, the catalyst is sodium hydroxide. So we mix sodium hydroxide in first into the eco, um, into the ethylene glycol, and then as soon as those the iron and cobalt are mixed in, then they immediately start to break away from their original uh, bronze. So uh, they they get reduced and then and, and then they oxidize, and so they form the iron cobalt initially um, as as very small particulates, and then our uh, theory is that, in which we've proven and, and we're hopefully publishing very soon, is that um, in, in this high concentration regime, even though those particulates are very small, because there are so many other similar iron cobalt particulates, then they can interact with each other. They have a net magnetic moment already, and it's further magnetized because of the magnetic spinner that's in the material, that's in the, the beaker um, mixing the liquid. And they can um, attract through a dipole-dipole interaction. So the magnetic moment north-south of one of them pulls the other uh, small particle near to it, and then they start growing from this stage. So two particles may have or formed a two-particle chain, and then another particle may get added, and then you start to get these longer chains that are growing together as one united um, magnetic nanoparticle chain. It's still unclear to us why they form specifically cubes, because most nanoparticle synthesis, you get spheres um, 
I, we're not yet sure why why they form the the nice cubic shape, but it's very clear in um, in both SEM and TEM images. Great. So, in terms of the nanoparticle stability in the elastomer matrix, do you see any irreversible um, properties to your elastomer? Can nanoparticles just uh, migrate through in response to the mechanical motion? Oh yeah, good question. So there were um, there's some work in the literature that showed like if the elastomer if there were too many mega nanoparticles in the elastomer they will actually punch through and leave behind holes. Um, but if the density of, of magnetic nanoparticles or, or chains is, is small enough and the elastomer is the predominant fraction. So at this point, we're looking at 6% per, per volume. Um, so the elastomer is the matrix is the majority of, of the volume and, and that's able to maintain it in there. Um, the other challenge that we're looking at right now is that these particles tend to be hydro Philic. So because they have oxidized on the surface, they actually want to, to mix better in water. But the silicone or the ecoflex that we're using, as well as PDMS, um, are hydrophobic. And so they tend to want to reject the particle. Um, so we have, that's probably another reason why we have more magnetic particle agglomeration or, or like packing of magnetic particles in an irregular manner than um, than having it be more uniform through the, the whole elastomer. Um, for, to fix that issue, we're uh, working with some chemists to see if we can functionalize the surface and then have it be more uniformly distributed through the elastomer and hopefully then more stable as well. But thanks for the Great. question. Great. So, so the next question is asking, could you comment on how you might create high resolution 2D displays where each magnetic pixel is individually controllable? Oh, good. Yeah, that's exactly what we're hoping to do. Um, so right now, if we let me switch to that kind of diagram um, here, what we're what I'm illustrating here are magnetic nano dots. So they're intentionally the control is intentionally very small uh, so that we can we can switch enough of them. We, if we alternate the magnetizations of them, then they'll create local magnetic fields and cause that bending. Or even if we just change one, it'll cause bending locally and it'll be enough to, to stretch a larger region. Um, and we can get the large scale deformation that we want for like, you know, these, these buttons that will protrude a millimeter or hopefully larger in, out of the plane. Um, but we can also get the micro texture resolution. So if, if we had larger controls, uh, like if, if the magnets were at the micro scale or larger, then we would suffer a couple of different things. First, the, your local magnetic field that won't allow you to get that um, bending that you want uh, for, for micro texture. So if we want to bend at a very small scale, um, they're over very short distances, then we need the, the local immediate change of magnetic field. Um, but also as you grow larger in magnetic, as your magnetic patterns grow larger, they also tend to be multi-domain. So I talked a little bit about that in this presentation. So the, the magnet itself will demagnetize um, on its own. And so it will not produce as much local magnetic field in the rest of the film to provide that deformation. Uh, so in summary, there are a lot of advantages to remaining small. So we can have these magnetic nano control dots to provide the local field for microtexture, but also each of those nano dots has a uniform magnetization that can provide a larger magnetic field than, than even um, a micro scale dot. Great. So there's a question about toxicity of cobalt. Would you uh, envision any challenges because of that? Right now, we're, we're not looking at biomedical applications. For sure, for sure, toxicity is a problem um, and, and is, a, is a challenge for, for all those trying to integrate um, you know, uh, magnetic nanoparticles for you know, MRI um, or for cancer treatment. But in, in this application, if it's perfectly embedded into the, eco, uh, into the elastomer, so it, it would not be um, protruding, right? So it, everything would be in, in closely Im clo clo closed and embedded in the elastomer. So there shouldn't be any interaction with our um, 
the human. And uh, even more than just the toxicity is also just the fact that they're magnetic nanoparticles, right? A, a nano powder could, could be very detrimental to our lung system, but it, it, it's fully encapsulated. So hopefully it's not a problem. Great, and uh, I guess the last question, have you worked on active shape change, for example, embedded copper coils within the system instead of relying on an external magnetic field to actuate the elastomer? Mm, good question, yeah. So we have, um, we have thought about it, but we have not implemented it. So the, the reason why we haven't implemented it um, is because if, if you look back at, let me pull up the slide where we did the large scale prototype. Um, for the large scale prototype, this was solenoid actuated, right? So it's it's almost as if you have Im embedded coils, as you said, um, right underneath the film to create that local magnetic field. One, um, when you're using current in coils instead of a magnet, the magnetic field is smaller, just significantly smaller, like <laughs> orders of magnitude lower, and you're constantly consuming current. So if we want to apply a magnetic field to, to cause that deformation and have the system keep the deformation, then you have to have a constant current being applied the whole time to produce that magnetic field. Versus if we use a, a magnet to provide the same magnetic field, then the interaction between these two magnets, all I did is just exert enough current to cause this one to switch. And it produces the local magnetic field for forever. So I my static, I, I do exert a lot of dynamic power for the switching, but my static power to maintain that deformation of the screen is zero. Um, and so that ends up being a lot more advantageous than, than to have embedded coils. Um, yeah, there, there are of course the challenges of switching and the size distribution and the local magnetization, but that's the main advantage that we're looking at. Uh, with that, thank you Amal for a great, very interesting talk and for your time. Thank you to our audience for joining today and um, our next seminar will be uh, in May. Thank you. Thank you, Amal. Thank you.